This is Profiler Milagros Kendall, agent number 2543, reporting in for case number 666. There's been a lot of recent activity in public spaces, so, uh, but for today there's one particular subject we're profiling. The first sighting was at a dusty gas station. And I will now start to review the agent's report logs to complete a profile summary of the subject. Well, as you know, it was my day off. I thought I was just gonna do a little road trip in the country. <laughs> and of course I'm back to work. I was going to get a fill up of gas. And I pulled into this tiny little gas station. I was really surprised to see it there. It wasn't even on the map. And as I was pulling out the nozzle, I noticed it was very dusty and it didn't work. But then I took a closer look at the dust. It was almost, it was almost breathing. I'd have to say that, the dust. It was all over. There was something very alive about it. And I knew, oh boy, I'm going back to work. There's something here. It seemed to be leftover remnant, a resin, if you will, of something not of this earth. I thought, now what? I gotta get on the old thinking cap, maybe call the girls, you know, the other agents. Uh, so I did put in a few calls. Some didn't pick up, sometimes they don't pick up, but some did. And uh, in the meantime, I was doing my own investigation. I started to touch it and there was a coldness about it, almost a brittleness to the dust, as if it needed cold. Did it react to your touch at all? It did, a little embarrassing. It started to envelop my fingers as I just put my finger on it to just kind of touch it and then it started to envelop, you know, like when you touch a, a, a line of ants and then they all get on you. Well, that's what happened. It started, so I shook it off. Fortunately, I had some Lair du Tom spray in my purse and for some reason it got repulsed by that. Hmm. What, what is Lair du Tom? I've never heard that. Lair du Tom, <laughs> something in the air. It's, it's a fragrance, it's a, it's a, it's a parfum, eau de parfum. Hmm. It's very popular in the 70s. Oh, nice. The air of time. The air of time. Interesting. I'm going to go to Agent Bishop, see what she has to say about this resin. So I cruise up in my converted Dodge Ram. Uh, you know, the one that I live in and that's got the mobile lab and all of that, you know, it's my vehicle, whatever. Right. Stop asking me about it. And um, first thing I notice is this gas station reeks of Lair du Temp. Man, have you ever smelled that? You ever go into like a, like a dinner theater, you know, classic dinner theater where they're doing like, I don't know, Little Mary Sunshine or 
whatever happened at the crossroads or uh, what's that one? Blythe Spirit. I love Blythe Spirit. Blythe Spirit's such a good play. Anyway, what I'm saying is when you get a lot of senior citizens in a room, you're going to smell a lot of l'air du temps. And <laughs> I said, whoa, is this the manifestation? And Baxter was, uh, no, she's shaking her head. She's pointing at the dust. The dust, which, of course, she touched. She's very touchy-feely. I don't like that. I don't like people touching stuff. <laughs> and so she touched it, she said, and it crawled up her hand. I ask you, is that the way you investigate something supernatural? You touch it first? No, I've learned that the hard way. You don't. You don't. So... Anyway, I said to her, you know what dust is usually made out of, right? Like what most dust is. And she said, oh, what? what? What's dust made out of? Human skin, Baxter. It's made out of human skin. So anyway, this is a particularly dusty gas station. I don't know if it's human skin or not, but I tell you what, it was so... Something shed off of something. Do you have any reason to believe that the dust was uh, was there and settled waiting, or was it waiting for something? Hmm. Yeah. You know, a lot of um, a lot of uh, ethereals, such as what we might have been encountering here uh, are what we call lion weight predators, you know, like an alligator. If you're walking in a swamp, you got to watch where you're walking because an alligator is not going to come and get you. It's waiting for you to step on it, right? And so a lion weight predator like this, it's waiting for you to go up to the gas station, try to fill up your tank, and then it crawls onto your body and I assume ingests you. Hmm. So I guess Baxter's lucky that she carried some lead jump in her little handbag because uh, that dust did not want to eat her. Hmm. Okay. So we have a dusty resin that seems to have some type of life or, or presence or consciousness. Uh, it crawled onto... Baxter's finger, but she was able to shake it off and uh, deter it with some L'Air du Temps perfume. So maybe it has some type of aversion to either liquid or more specifically this perfume, something in the perfume. Uh, wondering where this came from. Dorm database, which agent might be able to shed light on where this came from? Hmm, okay. No hits on that. Dorm database, which agent arrived next at the scene? Thought it could have been Diamond, but it was just, you know, some weird sounds I, I heard when I got there. I get sometimes, you know, a sense of like vibrations, like, you know, energy in places. And this place had a lot of energy from different spirits, I'm assuming. It seemed like it wasn't just <clears throat> one entity, even though it seemed to try to move as one. That dust, as I'm sure some other folks have probably discovered, was not just a dust. It was alive, like it was still on this side of things, or at least trying to fight from being on the other side of things. My guess was that it was some sort of spirit. You ever see uh, that old show, that old movie, Blythe Spirit? So good. It's like Agatha Christie and they do a seance and they're trying to bring something back. This is something that was like a remnant from maybe some sort of experiment, mm. so to speak, of trying to reach between worlds. And I think it went bad. Someone seemed to ditch it at this station because they thought no one would probably look into it because it looked abandoned. But as I looked a little further into the actual gas station itself, 
there seemed to be some more signs of life, like more recent life inside. Oh, what were those signs? Well, I saw a little light burning in the back. So I opened the kind of quirky door. That also seemed to be a front, because once you opened up inside, you could see some fresh, you know, wrappings and things like that. Like someone had just eaten and run real quick, had some snacks. You get hungry sometimes out in the middle of nowhere, so you got to plan ahead as looks like they did. So there were some remnants of that. There also seemed to be some etchings on the walls inside hmm. of some sort. My guess at first was maybe it looked like some young folks maybe were trying to have a little fun in a place, you know, sometimes as you do, getting caught up on things and trying to bring back spirits and getting above your elements. But this looked more calculated the closer I looked at it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Now the origins of it, I'm still trying to figure out. I know I know a lot of things, but sometimes going backwards is easier, it's harder than going forwards on things. Absolutely. <sighs> So, in looking at it, it looks like, again, potential summoning of some sort with these ruins. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Let's see what Miss Millie Mayhem has to say. I collect things. It's one of my hobbies. I don't have a specific collection that I always go towards. It's just if it catches my eye, I collect it. And one of the things I remember collecting was this little movie ticket. Did you know they did a filmed version of Blythe Spirit, I think is the name of the play? Everyone's asking me that. I've never seen it before. Oh, it's it's a silly little play. I think it was a filmed a movie version of it in 1940-something. And it's a fantastic play. The movie was so-so, and you should read the book. Always oh, read. There's a book too? Well, there's a play, there's a script. There's oh. a script that's a book, and then they take the script and they put it on stage, and that's when you call it a play. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah, yes, I'm familiar with that concept. I, I kept this little movie ticket from, it must have been my grandmother's movie ticket, Bly's Spirit. They do a little seance in in that movie. And what I remember from seeing it, now oh, of course I didn't see it when it opened because that was 1945 and I wasn't around then. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure. Never know, never know with I'm Dorn. sure, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. What I remember from the movie when I saw it after it was already out for several years was when there is a creature that dies. Sometimes humans, they decay into dust. When another creature dies and it's not done properly because there are ways to do things. If people learn the right way to do them, there's no cleanup required. Somebody tried to vanquish a demon hmm. and it went wrong and this type of demon when you vanquish it it's called a multiplicitor and the multiplicitor when it is not vanquished correctly becomes thousands and millions of tiny little microscopic creatures that will begin to grow if fed the right material. Oh, what right here. That's what poor Izzy had put onto her hand. And thank goodness for that l'air de temps, the air of time. Because who knew <laughs> that these microscopic demons were afraid of menopausal women's perfume. That's not meant to offend at all, of course. 
I'm sure she would not be offended by that. That's how she refers <laughs> to herself. Oh, good, good. I like it when people are honest. Me too. Hmm. Okay, so I need to talk to Dr. Diamond ASAP because we need to get some research done on this multiplicitor. Breaks, it, when not vanquished properly, it breaks into millions of microscopic pieces um, that then can grow into their own separate entity. This could be a really bad, such could be a really bad situation. What do you know about the multiplicitor? I cannot believe one of my first missions, I was late. I, I cannot believe. Baxter called me like three different times. And of course it had to come right around my time of the month, my time specifically. And of course I had been out the night before and I was still recovering and I missed the call. I missed the call. Oh, I don't even know how many times. I think by the time I was actually heading over there, they were they were calling me and talking about this dust and talking about this this multiplicitor and these these uh, these rune hieroglyphics and I'm being inundated with all of this information and I can't take it in. I don't know what. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It all just came rushing back. <sighs> ah. okay. I get I get very stressed when I don't um when I don't show up for people in the way that they want me to. And I am particularly nervous about showing up for this group because I want to impress them. And I want to show that I belong here and that my education and academic experience is something vital to our entity. What, what do we, I know we're, we're dorm, do, do we have a term? A term? I know we are agents and we are part of this department. Uh, do we have a group name outside of that? Oh, uh, you know, I, I've never even thought of whether or not we should have one. Oh, well, uh, maybe that can be one of my uh, new member assignments. <laughs> sure. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 I come up with other things to talk about when I'm nervous. This... Um, this endeavor was was a bit traumatic for me, as as, as you well know, um, because uh, it it was so many different elements of of things that um, um, uh, speak to my interests and also agitate me quite a lot. Uh, the 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 dust and the multiplicity, the 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 demon slaying gone wrong, um, the 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 death that ensued uh, of an innocent civilian is obviously. Very triggering for me after what happened to my parents. Of course, I understand. I'm going to take a moment to breathe, excuse me. I'm breathing with you. Thank you. I'm very grateful to have you as our profiler. You've been incredibly, well, I'm sorry. I, I need to keep it professional. No, it's all right. <laughs> So the I, rooms. Oh, no, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I I was an agent for several years, so I I know what you go through and you know, I just I'm just here to help. And you help me do my job, so I just want to help you do your job. Thank you. I feel better now. Good. All right. The thing that struck me as I was driving over to the gas station in all of the voicemails I was listening to as I was driving over, was that there was this strange combination of, of this dust-like creature, which I learned to be called a, a multiplicitor, mm -hmm. uh, which was a term I had not heard before. Um, it definitely awakened a lot of references to past creatures uh, in history, uh, and certainly those we've seen in um, many a, a demonic painting, uh, but it was unique to uh, my current research as we continue to uncover all the new uh, species that seem to uh, exist in this world. Um, but the thing that really struck me, and perhaps it was more of my <laughs> academic mind uh, that was inspired by this, but these these symbols, these runes um, that seem to be be deliberately uh, placed according to uh, Miss Johnson, uh, Agent Johnson, I should say, um, the imagery uh, was incredibly striking. There was something um, 
both abstract and incredibly concrete about the images. Uh, I was particularly struck um, by a, a long, um, um, what, what would you call that? A sort of, um, well, a bit like this, a sort of, uh, well, what I ended up interpreting it as is a sort of sword, a sort of um, uh, uh, spear, a spear, a, a weapon, a weapon of sorts, a, a cylindrical weapon, uh, something being raised above what I, again, began to interpret as a as a, a, a bipedal figure, I don't want to say human, who's to say, um, but some sort of bipedal human holding this cylindrical weapon-like sphere, um, cylindrical piece. I used maybe one too many terms there, but you understand. And it seemed to be pointing towards this other where it became a bit more abstract, this sort of um, dissipating, dissipating entity, I would mm. say, something sort of coming from below and and dispersing into the air, uh, almost as a consequence, almost as if it was a straight arrow into this, hmm. into this splashing, splashing, you would say, as if it were uh, perhaps some sort of liquid, uh, but, but not quite. There was something well, so... Like dust, maybe? <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, yes, it, I, I would say that it did seem to uh, mirror the events that we were seeing at hand, this, this um, interesting sort of um, spiritual dust. It, 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 you know, it evoked um, something about it. There was a, a, a sort of, um, while it was um, violent, there was also a certain sort of pulling. It sort of uh, reminded me of, um, what is it? Oh, it's a, it's an excellent um, it's an excellent book. Uh, have you have you read Blythe Spirit? No, no. Yes, yes, yes. Well, well, it's it's excellent. I haven't. I know that there's there are other iterations of it, but I I you know growing up I was a bit of a bookworm and I loved that book. I just read it over and over again. But one of the themes is really this sort of bringing forth of a spirit, and and I couldn't help but think it it reminded me of of that book. Okay. I really need to read more books. Okay, so we have images on the walls telling the story of what I think is probably this mythic hunter of this particular multiplicitor. Uh, we've seen this before, you know, an uh, ancient family line that is tasked with defeating a certain demon. So who is this hunter and what went wrong? If their family has known how to do this for centuries, for generations, how did they mess this up so badly? Dorm database. Dorm database. Who can tell me more about the mythic hunter? And well, there's an one. interesting parallel between uh, the spiritualism movement and the mid 90s 1990s mm -hmm. i mean think about blithe spirit again which we were talking about earlier um it's really a sweet little play i really like it and i think uh, angela lansbury did it oh yeah she's great great actress she's really big in the 90s she's big her whole career you a lansbury fan I mean, I, I watched a little bit of Murder, She Wrote. I mean, you gotta go way back. Court Jester, Bedknobs and Broomsticks. Beauty and the Beast? Beauty and the Beast. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we digress. <laughs> Don't mean to put you through your paces, profiler, but let's get back to the point. Yes, ma'am. The point is spiritualism, the 1990s. You know, the spiritualism movement, everybody was trying to summon ghosts, right? It's like a parlor trick. You'd have someone over, you'd have a seance. Oh, it's fun. In the 90s, there was a lot of demon worship stuff, demon scares, demon cults, and things like that. And so what I was taking in when I was looking at the runes on the walls of this dusty gas station was, uh, A, how amateurish they were. And uh, 
be how amateurish they were. You know, what what occurred to me was likely some, you know, little demon cult got together, thought that they would raise a multiplicitor, maybe to do their bidding, and then they'd use the spear, which is, you know, a real thing you can do. You can take the magic weapon, it's a spear, like it's a it's a hollow spear. Mm-hmm. It's made out of silver. The interior has to be lined with holy water and the tip has to be perfectly sharpened. You take this weapon and you summon the multiplicitor, you drive that in at a certain angle, you pin it to the spot and you get a certain amount of unlimited power, right? So if it goes wrong though, which it did, Mm. so my thinking is mid nineties, this gas station, they did this thing, unleash the multiplicitor and uh, <clears throat> it ate them. Mm. And then it's been eating roadside travelers ever since. Too bad it's pinned to the spot. All right. Um, Baxter, how are you feeling? Uh, I learned a bit about this multiplicitor and it was, you touched it. Well, I was horrified. <laughs> I was horrified, but then a whoo, close call. You, you know, you know what was extremely interesting for me was those rune symbols on the back because people were saying things about them that were just a lot of intellectual guesswork. But you know, I go in on the symbol right away. And when you see, when you see somebody with a big spear just kind of making things happen and just kind of things multiplying, well, that's very sexual. Yes, it is. <laughs> And what we learned from what I learned from from the symbols, the runes on the wall, first of all, there were six of them. There were six of them. And they 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 pointed to different places where they had multiplied, where where the spear came in. And what I saw was that the the hunter and the spirit had to work together to survive, just like the fire and the acorn, pine cone, so if you will. The bee and the flower, they must work together. Hmm. So, but what, just like the, 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 the spider has to get prey to feed Hmm. the young. So that once mm, 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 happens, it kills the hunter. But the hunter is drawn to the spirit. Interesting. You know what I love about Johnson? What? She's psychic. Yeah. And she knows things. She knows things I can't see, but I can see things she doesn't know. So when she led me into the room, why? I didn't know there were going to be runes in the room. And that's why I saw everything. The thing was, the thing was, it reminded me of light spirit. I thought, people think, and I thought too, that Johnson was talking to the spirit. But just like in the play, in the movie, in the book, it wasn't the psychic that was talking to the spirit. Spoiler. (laughs) Okay. Um, Johnson, were you talking to a spirit here? Well, like we talked about before, I think that this has got some sort of familial situation, like an ancient family. Mm -hmm. I think this was actually about a spirit being in a family way, so to speak. Oh. When you're passing down things from generation to generation, there's certain things you got to pass on, if you know what I mean. It's the only way we keep meeting and having more people here is more, you know. So uh, I think what I was speaking to was the next one was trying to rise. Mm. I think that there was a complication in the actual ceremony that led to the dispersion of the dust. Hmm. And when that spirit was split from the 
deliverer, the most multiplicitor. It was a problem. And I don't think that it knew exactly what to do. So it may have tried to settle around and try to flee the, flee the scene. I think that we're gonna, we ended up needing to look, that's how we ended up needing to look a little bit outside of the, the little gas station, just beyond. Okay. Uh, Miss Millie, Agent Millie, something, something went wrong, I hear, when you were on the, on the site at the gas station. What happened? <laughs> I was occasionally, I, I hydrate well. Did you know this? Yeah, um, I always see you with a bottle of water. I do. I keep a bottle of water in my car and in my fanny pack because you don't know when you're going to need water. Now, it's always holy, just in case. Sometimes I drink it. Sometimes I use it. But I had drank it today. And so I started going toward the little girl's room. And it was only one bathroom. And there was this electric buzzing coming out of the bathroom. I could tell it was coming from the bathroom. Now I thought, who better to investigate electric buzzing than a psychic? So I brought over Savani and I had her listen to the door. And she said she, said she could hear one voice. Now that, that was different because with the multiplicitor, you know, there would be many voices, a chorus of voices, if you will. Ah! But there was only one. And it was speaking to her, that voice. And Vanny, that's what I call her sometimes, Vanny, we're very good friends. Um, she started to cry when she was hearing this voice. She started to cry. When I asked her to tell me, what is that voice saying? She couldn't speak the words. They wouldn't come out of her mouth. So I grabbed her by the shoulders and I shook her. You know, sometimes shaking people helps them be able to talk. Shakes the sense back into them. And then when she spoke, it was another language. Johnson, can you recreate what you said in that moment? I believe is what I said initially, but then as I got a little deeper into the trance, it was Did you need more? No, oh, thank you, you so much. I just wanted to make sure we got that in the logs. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Okay. No problem. Dr. Diamond, do you have any translation for that? Well, yes, it, it was quite a jarring experience. Uh, I, I I came in and I, and I saw mid mid um, expression of of these terms, um, and so I I had to kind of backtrack and and uh, have poor Agent Johnson have to somewhat reiterate the the sounds. Um, but what really struck me was they were more on the um, guttural side, uh, much more um, less. Um, more, yes, consonant and guttural action rather than um, um, a lot of, um, uh, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, consonant bowels, goodness goodness me. I, now I'm the one uh, saying <laughs> improper. Um, it, anyway, um, <clears throat> yes, but what really struck me was that there was something in the back. It was not a, a language I was particularly familiar with um, as I have I studied more. You know, what I think actually served me in this moment is that because I, I focus more on the art in history, the imagery also, um, how does that imagery translate to sound? What is the, what is the imagery coming out of um, this vocalization? And so from my perspective, I felt it was much more of a, of an internal invocation uh, than an outward calling, 
Hmm. Um, and uh, interesting to note that we had this um, po quite possibly cylindrical hollow um, device. There was there's something about the internal needing to be filled, something about um, each person who is uh, being um, drawn in to this um, dust demon, multiplicitor, um, that it, it calls forth uh, an innate uh, organic sense um, that um, obviously Agent Johnson is already um, much more privy uh, than most of the other agents, that uh, it is her um, uh, life purpose to really be in touch with these greater realms. Uh, and so it only made sense uh, that she would indeed be the one to bring forth or bring inward um, mm. this new sense. But with that, something uh, simultaneously, in fact, whilst I was uh, walking towards Agent Johnson and uh, Agent Millie, I was suddenly struck. I was reminded, multiplicitor, I knew that it reminded me of creatures from the past that I had heard of, and not just, again, what we've spoken of, demons and that sort of stuff. Multiplicitor, multiplicitor, the hydra, the hydra of Greek mythology, wherein you cut off one head, two at least grow out. There are a few different interpretations and um, uh, of, of the number of heads that grow from the one. But this to me, there's, there's a correlation there between the growth of multiple and the internal invocation, that in fact, the internal invocation was creating a multiplied entity. This was this entity's survival tool. This is how this creature learned how to survive, was to, by any means necessary, utilize death, what could be called death, as a moment of real new life. Dr. Diamond, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just got a tip on our anonymous hotline that yes. you, you have a secret. Is there something you need to tell us? Well, uh, how about I come back to you? I, all right. <laughs> um, I don't why don't you get a cup of tea and we'll sit back down and we'll talk. <laughs> of course, whatever, whatever you prefer. Okay. So, the multiplicitor harkens back to the Hydra, wherein it has a, multi a multiplicity to it. It can re be reborn when it gets torn apart or c its head cut off. There's a lot of references here. Okay. Um, let me go... Let me go to Miss Millie, see what was happening in the bathroom at that point. The door was stuck. So we couldn't open it. But when I was there shaking, Vanny, I remembered another place I had heard these words. When Dr. Diamond was very young, very, very young, she came to me. I'm a teacher. She was one of my students. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's a great student, by the way. She's the one that does the project. No one else does it. She'll do it. And she'll always get an A. And she won't complain and she won't tattle. She wouldn't tattle. I tried to get her to tattle. I remember it was her fourth grade year and I knew that it was only her work. You might even say that, well, she had created a diorama of the Milky Way. Very complete too, more complete than any of the other students' diorama. I kept it. I'm a collector and I knew it was only hers and I went to her and I said, this is only your work. At this point, her parents were alive. Hmm. And she said, no, we all did it, all three of us. Stephen, Michael and myself, Stephen and Michael were two little boys in the class. I knew they didn't do anything. I remember at that point, Dr. Diamond, had a film over her glasses 
She had glasses very young. And it was this dust. Dust. I didn't think, because I didn't really know at the time, I hadn't educated myself on what a multiplicitor was. But I knew Dr. Diamond had had experience with multiplicitors. It was three days later that her parents died. And when she came into my care, I run a little boarding house. <laughs> After her parents died, she came into my care. And every night, for many nights, I would hear bits and pieces of this exact phrase that Vanny had just spoken to me and that all rushed in in that moment. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh, somebody's going to get triggered. <laughs> so I apologize for springing that on you. I just, I was disturbed when we got this anonymous tip that you somehow may have some knowledge you may be holding back. Is that true? It's... I have more... I have more experience with this sort of thing than I maybe initially led you to believe. Okay. I know that the department is aware of certain aspects of my life and how I'm able to maintain it. But what I haven't shared is how it came to be. Unfortunately, I think this sort of material is incredibly infectious. Not to everyone, only to those, one could say, destined to be changed by it. When I was very young, I interacted with what I can only assume is another form of this sort of multiplicitor. Mm. And I believe that what is It's what caused my DNA to change. I am not... I'm not a werewolf as a consequence of being attacked. It was something that happened. And now I think I know why. I only wish I had realized at the time my parents might still be around. Poor Dr. Diamond. I didn't realize. I didn't realize. She felt so guilty about her parents' death. Miss Millie, Dr. Diamond revealed some things to us. Oh good, I didn't want to be the one to tell you that she mauled her parents. It was terrible. Uh, well, she hadn't um, mentioned that. Oh, oh, what did she say? Um. Well, she did say that she felt guilty about her parents' death and um, that she made it were... to a multiplicitor at an early age and it changed her DNA. Yes, her parents were dealing with, well, her parents were slayers and they were themselves trying to vanquish a demon. It went wrong, multiplicitor attacked. Her DNA changed because of that. She lost control. 
and she took out her parents. Now they were going to die anyway, you must understand. <laughs> they were not going to survive that attack from the multiplicitor. So she really completed a process that would have been long and painful in a slightly painful, much more gory way, but it was going to happen. She shouldn't feel guilty. I tell her this, I say that, will you tell her that for me? She shouldn't feel guilty. I will. Bishop, what are your thoughts on all this with Diamond? Oh, with Diamond? Yeah. Well, you know, in the back of my truck, I've got a werewolf kit just in case. Chains and silver bullets and such, just in case. Um, but she and I get along pretty well. So, so far so good. Uh... But it's interesting because I'm a, maybe a little old school about it. I always thought werewolves were just bites. You know, you get bitten and it transfers and that's how that goes. But multiplicitors, right, they're devious. And I was talking to Baxter. She was talking about, you know, she's, I got to say, I think she's a little horny. <laughs> she's always the one that's like you know what this reminds me of sex and I'm like sure <laughs> yeah it reminds me of sex too uh, so she's going on about the symbology of the sphere the spear the spear and uh, uh, the multiplying aspect and then we were th thinking about the the internal invocation that was being heard out of the the, the electrical system, and it made me think about pregnancy cravings. Hmm. And, you know, maybe Diamond's multiplicitor was craving a little bit of a fourth grader and two adults, and that was perfect. And then it inhabited her the way it did, changed her DNA, and the end you know there's no multiplicitor living in diamond is what i'm saying that would be really horrifying werewolf fine multiplicitor ooh, ooh, ooh. that's a thing anyway i feel like i'm getting off topic <sighs> pregnancy cravings yes so here's this multiplicitor involved in a botched ceremony where then it's still trying to do the thing it does, which is procreate. And uh, it just hasn't gotten fed the right things. And so we agents had to ask ourselves, are we going to feed it? Or are we going to complete the ceremony and send it on its way? It's a complicated question. I mean, I think it's eaten a, a lot a lot of humans at this point. So in my mind, there's no peace treaty there. But on the other hand, how do we know it's not going to be another Dr. Diamond? She's great. Baxter, what are your thoughts on the case so far? I didn't know what to say. I was speechless. So there was chaos. And, and what happened, we knew it, the, the something needed to be fed. So I had a moon pie. Um, Miss Millie had some lollipops. Um, uh, 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 Winnie had some hard tack. Um, and poor, poor Johnson, she, she was still there, you know, guttering these words. We were trying to get it under control. And then I saw, oh, this is why Dr. Diamond is late, because she's never late. And, and apparently, she had to have it out with the multiplicitor. Oh, like a, like a showdown? Exactly. She changed form like that. 
and she broke down that door and we all stood back. Johnson started to come too because the dusty thing was coming out of her. And then it started to take form and Simon and it were like head to head. It was a standoff. What did you do in that moment? Did you do anything? Well, I started spraying my Lair du Tom. Millie started throwing her water. Johnson started coming too. She started fanning everything. They do that in the South a lot. They fan a lot. And Bishop went back to her car to get some bullets and chains and such. I don't know what it was. But it was chaos. But it was a standoff. But it was chaos. But it was a standoff. It's kind of exciting. Okay. Uh, Diamond, what happened next? I'm being completely honest. I don't remember most of what happened. Uh, it was certainly what would, one would call a, a, a primal instinct, uh, one that I have spent many years trying to restrain. And um, it is, it, it is, uh, it's not something I like talking about, but for the sake of science and academia and the protection of the world, What I do remember was a sort of, of, of a sort of thrashing. Like I said earlier, uh, I was thinking of how Johnson's words were as much internal as external. So that was what I tried to embody in my combat, was a sort of internal awakening of something deep inside me that I knew could defeat this monster. And so I too, began to invoke these sorts of words, the sort of but then it turned more, more into, more into what I fear the most, the sort of you cannot defeat us. You must stand back. You must go back into the earth. Which was something I hadn't realized needed to be done. But in fact, we needed this entity to go back into the earth. Something reminiscent of this pole, this, this, this cylinder, that it was truly something that was at, its, at the earth's core or something like that. And so once again, and I, I, I encourage the other agents, the other women, Go back into the earth! Go back into the earth! Go back into the earth! Millie. It was... Have you ever seen a werewolf howling at the top of its lungs and then singing and then howling and then shouting and commit... <gasps> It was incredible. Vanny started joining her. Oh, it was beautiful. I think Isabella dipped into the dream world, watching the team work. And <laughs> I had to hold Winnie back. Winnie had weapons of all sorts. I was throwing the holy water just to have a little fun, but oh, they had it. Vanny and Diamond, they were. It was beautiful. The form that this dust took, it multiplied and multiplied until it was an incredibly large spider reaching out with thousands of arms, reaching for our necks. And then Diamond's voice, supported by Vanny's, echoed in. And the thing drew back into itself and it vibrated there one moment. And then it started to fall, melt to the ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Uh, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I kept something from the moment in the, um, in the, the, the uh, you know, they have, they have those little bathroom keys. 
Mm-hmm. In the gas station. Like on a spatula or a spoon so you don't lose it? This one was on an entire fry pan. <laughs> and I kept it. <laughs> I have it hanging above my mantle now. I rotate whatever piece goes there. <laughs> oh, gosh, you should have been there. You should be in the field. You should. <sighs> yeah, maybe one day I'll get back out. <sighs> Bishop. Mm. Yeah. You know, I have my suspicions about mayhem. It's uh, strangely strong. <clears throat> and she collects stuff. Yes, she does. Yeah, that's 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 a bad sign. It's it's a mystery to me how she can drink holy water cuz I'm pretty sure there's something going on there. I'm going to mm. find it out. Yeah. Hmm. I'm going to be watching her. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to be watching her. So what happened was Diamond starts wolfing out. She's chanting. She's saying things in other languages. She's encanting. And then Savannah, she's also encanting. Baxter's communicating up on the spiritual realm. So you know what I do? Of course, I go get my werewolf supplies. Because listen. I know I'm not gonna chain up a multi- multiplicitor with werewolf supplies, but diamond's gone all wolfy. So I get my silver bullets, I get my chain. Mayhem's holding me back, which was surprising, as I said. <gasps> Very suspicious. Very suspicious. She's curiously strong. Yeah, so after uh, after that thing went <laughs> back into the earth, I, um, I chained diamond up in the back of my van. You know, got to take precautions. When she comes to, we'll get a beer. Uh, Johnson, were you conscious of what was going on during this time? Only mildly so. I was partly lucid during some of the motion. I know that there was a great battle happening around me with Diamond, you know, fighting this entity. But mostly I felt a sense of calm come over me like it was being handled, like it was getting what it wanted. You know, sometimes when a spirit is unsettled, you can really feel that. But when it's getting some sort of resolution or restitution, you can also feel that too. I was actually able to find moments of (sighs) quiet and still breath. Mm -hmm. even in the midst of the commotion that was happening around me as it was finding its center and finding its peace. Like it was coming back around, like a sense of prophecy might have been being fulfilled in that moment. Mm -hmm. I think that Diamond, like her namesake, is very special and precious and may hold the key to a lot of things, actually. I think she's got more going on in her life than she even knows. Mm. When she's ready to see it, I'll talk with her about it. I've seen a big, bright future for her. Mm. Sounds like Diamond has a good support system with these agents. Baxter. Well, fortunately, I was able to grab Agent Johnson into the dream world with me to give her some comfort while Diamond and the entity and and Bishop were all going at it. So she she got a little calm. And what was fun, we had a little chat, but I don't think she remembers. But she did promise that we were going to go see a movie together. And then and then when it all came out, when 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 they drove away in the truck and, and, and everything was settled, the dust settled um (laughs) johnson and i said hey millie want to go see a film and 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 millie just kind of smiled at us this eerie smile and she said i have to season a pan (laughs) so what is the resolution for you I don't like being treated like a creature. I don't like being chained to the back of Bishop's truck. I don't want to be utilized for my abilities only to be thrust aside. 
seen as something other. I want to belong. I want to be empowered by what I have to offer. And even though I know I've been trying to tell myself that I'm here because of my academic prowess. I know I'm really here because I have a connection to the thing that we're hunting. Because if I hadn't been lucky enough to have Agent Millie as a teacher, if I hadn't been recognized as someone who could grow and move past her nature. I easily could have been that multiplicitor today. I am ready to do my profile summary. This is Profiler Milagros Kendall, agent number 2543, providing a profile summary on case number 666, the multiplicitor. Victimology is complicated because it has a connection with an ancient line of families, but it does seek out anything to consume, and that includes human flesh. Uh, Past victims include Agent Diamond's parents although they were finished off by Agent Diamond. There's a separate report for that case. Crime scene details. This was in a rural, dusty gas station off the side of the road. Uh, The crime scene itself was uh, dusty, covered with dust, which we then found was bits of the multiplicitor itself. This is a, let's see, the type is... I believe it is a demon, maybe some type of hybrid as well. Again, it has a symbiotic relationship with this ancient line of family hunters that basically incept the demon itself so that it can be sent back to the earth, but sometimes it goes wrong. I have no reason to believe that the multiplicitor itself has high sentience. It seems to have at least the level of an animal or a creature that wants to survive, but I do not believe it has a higher intelligence than that. Behavioral analysis, it includes uh, prey, hunting its prey, which can be many different forms of life and types of food as well. Historical references, uh, there is some hearkening back to the Hydra, but it seems like there are no solid specific references to the Multiplicitor uh, before the 90s when Dr. Diamond had her run-in with it. The status of the Multiplicitor is that it was exorcised and banished back into the Earth. And now... I'd like to thank the following agents for their contributions in tips and assistance for this mission. See No Evil Cast, as well as Agent J Pistol and Agent Arsenal Roy 2K. Thank you for your tips and assistance in cracking this case. My name's Agent Profiler Milagros Kendall, agent number 2543, and I'm signing off.